Why hello, ladies and gentlemen. On today's show, it is a really special guest that I'm being joined by, not to talk necessarily all current Padres, but the legend of Ken Caminetti. It's going to be a good one, a book discussion. We've done a bunch of these before. I'm very excited for this. Nostalgia feels important. You guys know what you're listening to. Locked on Padres. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. You are locked on Padres. Your daily San Diego Padres podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Lockdown Padres Podcast, which is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day for some time uh, in the week of May 1st through 7th or 5th or whatever. Sometime then, don't know exactly what, guys. As you can tell, as always, I'm your host with sometimes occasionally, but certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. You can find me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O or at LO underscore Padres on Twitter for all your Padres-centric needs and dreams. Um, And today, I'm being joined by a very, very special guest, someone who I actually, because Twitter is awesome every now now and then. It hasn't been the best of news for some people. Yeah, sometimes it's pretty good. Uh, Mr. Dan Good, there you go. Uh, First of all, before we even, how many puns do you get of your name, like, per hour? All of them. All of them. All the time. Good day uh everything uh good times uh are you good yes no um when i played football in high school uh the coach would try to tell me how i was doing in drills and he'd say bad good he'd have to like preface it with a big pause bad good so it's been it's been a life of good good puns yeah i imagine i imagine we're gonna be talking about something very cool today, very good today, and that fee of Ken Caminiti, of course, Padres legend. Uh, back in the late '90s, teams people might be familiar. I know it's familiar with because you know I was born back then. I didn't know as much. We're going to be talking about Dan's new book, "Playing Through the Pe- Pain: Biography of Ken Caminiti." It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, very excited, and of course, guys, thank you for making. Lockdown Padres, your first listen every day. We're free and available on all platforms. But before we kind of dive into the book, because I want to dive as deep as possible into this bad boy. All right. Before we get into it, what is kind of, can you describe the the fandom connections that you have personally with the Padres aside from um, Ken and just the team in general and baseball in general? What, where do you kind of, you know, attack this from? As of course. So I am a huge baseball fan, huge baseball fan of the 90s. My team growing up was the Texas Rangers. Um, when Nolan Ryan was pitching near the end of his career, mm-hmm. I was just drawn in by him. And then Juan Gonzalez won the home run derby in 93 in Baltimore. He beat Ken Griffey Jr., even though Griffey hit the warehouse. Juan Gonzalez won that one. And uh, they had all these exciting players. And I was just really just enamored and in love with the game. And, you know, as you go through the 90s, you know, you look at Sports Center, you look at baseball cards there's all these different ways to collect. And and that really kind of opened up my avenues to collecting and opened up my uh, perspectives and appreciation of different players across the league that maybe you didn't get to watch all the time. Cause I grew up in central Pennsylvania. Uh, so I didn't get to see the Padres all the time, but I got to watch sports center and you see these highlights day after day after day of Ken Caminiti and players like him. And I just really appreciated the hustle and the heart and the intensity he brought um, so I, it was, it's interesting because I never actually got to see him play, but I always saw his teams either when he was on the DL or when, uh, he had been, uh, you know, released or something like that. So I actually, I saw the Padres play in 99 was the year after he left. Um, you know, and I got to see the Reds a lot. My mom's favorite team was the Reds. Uh, I got to see the Phillies a lot. Uh, my dad's favorite team was the Phillies. Uh, my brother's favorite team was the Astros. So we had this very eclectic uh, kind of household in terms of fandom. And, uh, and that really just drove my appreciation for all these different teams. But, you know, I look at the heart of the nineties and um, I just feel like those, those Padres teams from the nineties were a lot of fun, a lot of great players, a lot of veteran players. And, um, you know, it was disappointing when they, they broke that team up in 98 after the 98 season. Mm-hmm. Um, but just, just fell in love with nineties baseball. I just think it's, it was so much fun back then. 
Yeah, baseball back then, there is definitely this kind of nostalgia for it uh, amongst a certain group of people. And and I think that that's a their hardcore kind of fan base and whatnot. You know, not the, the get off my lawn types, but I do think that there is something I didn't like the documentary. But, you know, what is it, like a year and a half ago, the long summer mm-hmm. documentary. Like, there is this yeah. genuine love for old uh, times and baseball because that's when it really felt was the cultural you know, magna culpa of what it used to be you know what i'm saying it's still important now but it definitely was was bigger back then i personally love the 1996 team because i was born <laughs> in 1996 and my favorite nice. movie of all time or one of my favorite movies is from 1996 shout out will smith and independence day <laughs> or um, maybe shouldn't be shouting out will smith right now but <laughs> you get my point um oh, uh, that was really great and ricky henderson year you know that was yes. really fun uh, and whatnot i totally knew what was going on at the ripe old age of four months but nonetheless <laughs> it was a, a really fun team and i think that that's what's interesting about the padres is i know that the 84 team is one that makes the world series i know 98 and whatnot but they had a really good stretch and a lot of that i think revolves around ken you know what i'm saying yeah. they had really good teams unfortunately they did kind of run into the yankees buzzsaw of the late 90s and that's just kind of where baseball was at those teams were winning 105 games like it was going out of style easily and whatnot you don't have to get all into all of that but now i just want to ask you what brought you just initially into wanting to do this biography on ken caminetti what was kind of the draw for you and you know before we get into the process yeah simple as that just what was kind of, of your, your your reason to get into it I was always, as I said before, I was always intrigued by him as a player. I respected the way he approached the game. And I just felt like, you know, you just watch him play. You're like, this guy's awesome. Um, You know, I think I was more in tune to his story. Uh, My dad had passed away when I was 14 years old. So I felt like that kind of opened me up to more stories about sadness or tragedy. So I think there's definitely that aspect. But at the same time, like, I just appreciated him as a player And then when in 2002, we came forward to Sports Illustrated to talk about his steroid use, you know, this this watershed major moment in baseball history, I really had so much respect for that. Um, And I know it wasn't easy and there was complicated reasons for him coming forward and talking about it. But um, I felt like him being honest and truthful when there's so many players who weren't and I don't begrudge them for not being truthful. Like it's we're still talking about this so many years later, Mm -hmm. like people care. People have these really heated opinions about this thing, but for him to come forward and be honest and truthful at a time when people weren't, it really meant so much to me. And then when he passed away, I was really moved by it. I remember I was actually in college at the time and I wrote a column about his death because it was just like, just sudden and tragic in the similar way of like a Kobe Bryant or Roy Halladay or Walter Payton, you know, these guys, you know, you felt like there was more of a second act there. And I I felt like with Ken, especially like, um, you know, you wanted that, that, turnaround for him. You wanted that good ending. And it's sad that he didn't get that. And um, I just was always moved by his story and drawn in by that. And as the years passed and I became a journalist, um, I was kind of waiting for somebody else to write that book and no one did. Uh, So I eventually just started, I was working overnights at the time. So I had all this free time during the day. And I said, I'm just going to start researching his life. Like I really didn't feel like I was in a place to call anybody you know, interview anybody. I just wanted to think about it and and spend a lot of time thinking about it. And I did that for about a year. I think it took about a year before I felt confident enough to actually start talking to people. Even then I was like, eh, I don't know. Like, I don't know. And then, you know, you'd start talking to a couple people here and there and more people talk and more people talk. And next thing you know, you've talked to 400 people. And now you're like, you know, I have an obligation to all these people to to get this story right and to tell it and, you know, and make sure it resonates. And, um, it's been a, it's been a journey, but I, I just, I just come back to the, um, the way he approached the game, the, the way he approached playing, you know, putting it all out there and, and, you know, um, just working harder than everybody, uh, out hustling everybody, uh, those diving stops at third base, the rifle throws across the diamond switch hit power. Um, you know, he was at his best in San Diego. He had those great years with the Padres and Mm -hmm. his story is sad, but his story is interesting. I think it says a lot about, um, who we are people wise, you know, who we are in society and, um, the struggles we all face because we all face struggles. And it's just been interesting to, to dive into that and and spend time trying to make sense of his life. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. And we're going to be talking a little bit more in depth about the book and whatnot and what have you, but clearly it takes a good eye 
to, you know, find these sort of stories and interviews and whatnot, all that journalistic stuff. But you know what else takes a good eye, Dan? What's that? The the right team to bet on. <laughs> to find <laughs> what are the best odds, ladies and gentlemen. And there is no place better than checking out those odds than betonline.net, your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. You can find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, news. You know, we've got the basketball playoffs going around. Shout out Chris Paul. Had an amazing game yeah. about five, six days ago. My favorite player ever. He was a dog in that game six. Uh, awesome stuff. And, of course, obviously Major League Baseball season is underway and you can find all the bets and whatnot that you need live betting wagering information whatever you need esports they got you covered there all that stuff over at bet online guys head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action bet online where the game starts and again just reminding everybody thank you for making lockdown potters your first listen every day free and available on all platforms including youtube where you can see uh, my yellow bright shirt and you can see Dan and his a massive book collection featuring the book that we are talking about today being prominently displayed, of course. Um, very, very good job by you, sir. Um, but let's 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 keep going into it. You mentioned kind of the, the the steroid stuff. And I think that that's so interesting because, first of all, it's just amazing how we view steroids now. Because I remember growing up for me, the first major one that was like it's this is news and this is like leading sports center was Alex Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. I still remember when that came out, it was like, oh, my God. And it's just so funny when you look back and see how much our thinking about these things changed. Not necessarily. I'm not talking about whether or not I'm not even talking about the Hall of Fame discourse. I'm just talking about how, hey, I remember once upon a time when Michael Phelps got caught, you know, smoking a bong at a party and everything, everyone was losing their minds. Nowadays, it becomes a meme on Twitter for five seconds and then we're done. You know what I'm saying? And then. Back then with Ken Kemeny, with the steroid issue kind of being something that was rising through baseball, you know, was that something that was a big part about writing about the book or was it just a sort of side note and what have you? No, I think it became a big part. Um, you know, and I think that's why um, I, I actually made the subtitle uh, Ken Kemeny and the steroids confession that changed baseball forever, because I think I think his story is intertwined with this. But I also think that it was such a massive part of baseball back then. And the lines are so blurred in terms of where the cheating is and where it's just something that people are using. It was all throughout the game. People and, you know, players from all shapes and sizes were using it. Um, you know, that that pitcher that's trying to make the team, that fourth outfielder, um, mm -hmm. you know, the guy who's in the minor leagues, that quad A player trying to make it. Uh, mm -hmm. Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens and Alex Rodriguez and Mark McGuire, they get all this attention because they were at they were at this tier already and it just pushed them to that next tier. But I think mm -hmm. it, it begs the question of why they were using. It's because yes. other players mm -hmm. were using and because they felt like they were falling behind. They weren't the players they used to be. They couldn't compete the way they used to be. And, you know, I think with Ken's case, too, I mean, I think it was something he grappled with for a long time as he. Uh, you know, advanced through his major league career from the his 20s into his late 20s with the Astros. This was something he was thinking about and not specifically doing it, but thinking about the possibility of doing it. Um, you know, and I, I also think that, you know, growing up in the 70s and the 80s, especially in California, um, you had these pockets of people around gyms who were using steroids. So steroids, by and large, weren't something that were completely forbidden to him because he knew people in his network, people that were close to him that were using steroids. So it wasn't this big, you know, big thing. It was a big thing, but it wasn't a big thing at the same time. Like, you know, mm -hmm. if you're constantly surrounded by this stuff, it's not a big deal for you to use it yourself. So, um, so there's that aspect to it. And then it's the fact that it's everywhere in the game. Um, yeah. You know, and, and and some guys used it and said, this isn't for me. Other guys said, I'm not actually better as a player when I'm using this stuff, so I'm going to filter off of it. But, you know, I think a lot of the focus and attention has been on those top tier players. And, and look, Ken was an all star without using steroids. Yeah. Mm hmm. 100%. Like 1994, he was an all star. Um, you know, if he was taking better care of himself in the early part of his career. He may have been an all-star at other points. His 1989 season was sublime, especially on defense. Uh, but people weren't paying attention to it because he was playing for the Astros. 
Um, but 94, he was an all-star by himself, naturally without steroids. Um, you know, and then you took, uh, started to take steroids in 95, 96. And that's when he went from an all-star to a superstar. And um, it, it definitely helped him raise that level. But there were other things at play, too. Uh, he was more grounded in his personal life. You know, he'd become a born-again Christian. Um, you know, there were some really good things happening. And he was in a really stable place. But uh, so steroids kind of entered the, the mix at a time when, you know, he was in a really solid ground. And he felt supported on his team. You know, Bruce Bochy was an awesome manager for him. And I think that's another piece of the story. And, um, you know, I just think that, um, you know, the steroids are part of it. And, um, you know, as people talk about his legacy, that's probably his biggest legacy is coming forward. As much as you look at 96 and he was awesome and he won the MVP award, there's always this thing about, oh, he came forward to talk about steroids. Like he was a good yeah. player who then came forward to talk about steroids. And I, I think it was difficult to disconnect those two things. I felt like they all kind of blended together, but they spoke to his competitiveness. You know, he wanted to be the best to help his team. And especially when he hurt his rotator cuff, you know, the first week of the 96 season, I, I think he felt like he didn't have any other option because otherwise he's not playing and his team is not going to succeed. So I felt like, you know, I think there was a, as much as a personal uh, mission and a personal reason for it, I also feel like there was that team aspect that he was going to help the team win however he could. Yeah, absolutely. That was a long and perfect answer to my question, sir. I mean, but but here's the thing is that steroids, that is so how much they're integral to baseball, um, for better or worse, right? That this is so much part of the game. And I think that sometimes the discussion gets a little bit watered down and diluted a bit. But that's what's really fascinating here is that you know, people forget a little bit with Ken because you had some of these other guys that come out and or some of them not even coming out, but just testing positive and all that stuff. I'm wondering, though, you know, you mentioned uh, Bruce Bochy and whatnot, which I imagine gets a lot of Padres fans nostalgic for yeah. them. What is kind of like what are some things you think for? Because this is, a, I imagine, just a, a great book. You're a great writer, but I imagine that just from the every baseball fan will enjoy this. But what are some things that you think Padres fans specifically because? This is the oh, wrong way. This is the Locked On Padres podcast <laughs> yes. after all. You know what I'm yes. saying? What do you think are some specific treats or nuggets? And not I don't want to say treats or nuggets in the way saying that this is necessarily a happy tale. But in sure. terms of the real Padres, people that you might have talked to, any sorts of things that you talk about that they might find really exciting about the about the there are There are some awesome nuggets from the Padres days, and I'm happy to talk about them. I mean, it starts at the beginning when Ken got traded to the Padres. You know, they talk about this 12 player trade and how it was sorted yeah. out. This thing was hammered out near Thanksgiving of 94 during the strike. And it was kept quiet for six weeks. They had the trade locked out and they said, well, Padres have new ownership coming in. So we're going to wait to announce it until the new ownership comes in. So the Astros and the Padres kept, kept this trade quiet for six weeks, which you can't even imagine things staying silent for six hours anymore with the the nature the speed of information being shared um so there's that aspect um you know i loved calling talking to these padres people these personalities one of my favorites was bochi um i i cold called him because i was trying to get in touch with him through the giants when he was a giants manager and it never worked out and then he left the giants and he's at home. And I just decided to cold call him. I called him from a couple of numbers I thought might be connected to him. And I left a message and I forgot about it. And like two weeks later, I get this call back and it's this, this gravelly voice. And I was like, it's either, it's either him or it's not him. But I answered, it's this gravelly voice. It's Bruce Bochy. Talked <laughs> to him for 45 minutes. It was amazing. Uh, he, was, he was awesome. He was awesome and like really thoughtful. You know, he has that gruff persona, but there's really that, that thoughtfulness underneath it. And he was fantastic. Um, you know, but you look at you look at those Padres years and you look at um, John Moore's love, Ken, Kevin Towers love, Ken. I talked to Kevin Towers and, and that's you know, he died a couple of years ago and it's very sad to think about. But I have I have interview. I have quotes from him in this book, um, along with a couple other people who have since passed away. And, um, you know, it just it's neat looking at the way that those teams were built up, you know, because you have the little additions and the Ashby comes over. And Ken comes over and Steve Finley comes over. And finally, they have this team that's that's turning the corner and they have Tony Gwynn and they have a couple other parts. And, uh, you know, in 96, the Greg Vaughn trade, 
The funny thing about the Greg Vaughn trade, too, was um, Ken and Greg Vaughn never played against each other because Greg was in the American League, Ken was in the National League, and they met each other at the All-Star Game in 96, mm -hmm. and they were on the bus going from the stadium back to the hotel, and they talked for a couple minutes, and they became fast friends. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, Greg gets traded to the Padres, and Ken was so stoked because here's this guy, here he's coming to play. So Greg ends up staying with Ken uh, for the rest of the 96 season. He literally stayed with him. They were roommates. It was awesome. Um, <laughs> you know, and then just even looking at the end of the 96 season, that final series against the Dodgers, you know, you have to win all three and this come from behind, never die mentality. Um, Bob Tewksbury was pitching that final game, and he told me a story about how um, the, the day before they had won the second game, and they had clinched the wild card. And Ken was telling the whole clubhouse, like, don't celebrate. We're going to come back and we're going to win this thing. And we're going to win the division outright tomorrow. And, it, you know, it's so nerve wracking. To, like, you know, here's this teammate of yours telling you, like, no, we're going to do it this way. And it's all on you. And uh, Tewksbury went out and pitched a gem. He pitched seven innings, uh, didn't give up a run. They end up winning in dramatic fashion with, you know, Chris Gwynn. And uh, it was just awesome. Little things like that. And, um you know, I, I just it was really awesome to see the way that uh, the fans appreciated Ken and the way that Ken appreciated the fans. Um, I even go back to um, Cindy Matters. She was a fan of the Padres who had passed away in 1997, early 1997. She was a really big fan of Brad Ausmus and uh, and she died. And the Padres wanted to do something special to celebrate her. And Michelle Anderson, who was the Padres PR um, lead, she was walking around to the players, talking to them about what they wanted to do to, to celebrate her. And, you know, they're going to do a, a giveaway, a raffle. And she came up to Ken. It was, you know, kind of before a game. And Ken was in this, he had this moody kind of scowl about him. You know, he has that scowl sometimes. And Michelle went up to him and said, uh, you know, going to do this thing. Wanted to see what you wanted to do. And he really didn't have much to say. And she thought, oh, he's in a bad mood. I'm not going to bother him. And then the next day she comes into the clubhouse and he walks up to her and he's like, I've been thinking about this uh, this giveaway and I want to donate one of my motorcycles. And it just the little things like that, like he was really thoughtful to people. Uh, he really went out of his way to think about other people. And, um, you know, there's there's obviously sadness in his story and there's sadness in the book. But I think there's also that light. You know, he was a good guy and he left a, an impact for a lot of people in a, in a really positive way. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's really well said and very exciting. Hey, I love the fan perspective too. But before we get into more of that, I don't really have a clever transition this time though, guys, uh, because Dan is just going off on the anecdotes right now. Let me tell you, I love it though. I love it though. Uh, this is very, very good stuff. Um, before we continue though, guys, and we got much more left, let me tell you really quickly about rockauto.com, which is for, well, you know, auto, automobiles, cars, all that sort of stuff. I don't know much about cars personally. I don't currently own a vehicle of transportation other than maybe my bicycle, but I don't know where that is right now. So basically nothing, but let me tell you, Rock Auto has you covered with all your car related needs. And one of the biggest things is that they help you save money. Why choose to spend up to 30, 50, and even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership? That doesn't make any sense, man. Their Hot on Odyssey fuel pump, it's only $216 compared to $353 from chain stores. They've been serving do it yourselfers for 20 years guys they're absolutely killing it and even for a schmuck like me i at least had an idea when i checked the website what i was looking at their website is really easy to navigate and you can find you know tail lamps more oil new carpet whatever you need they've got you covered guys so go to rockout.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on in their how'd you hear about us box so they know we sent you amazing Selection, reliable low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. Dan, let me let me let me tell you. All right. It's uh, the amount of I just this is good. This is great. And it's funny because I was reading a book by Harvey Ayrton um a while back about the Knicks and talking about his relationship with with a fan. So I really like the idea of just getting like fan perspectives and whatnot and these these people that were such huge fans of the team. I'm wondering if you have people that you're a fan of, or more specifically, what kind of was, you know, there's a lot of baseball books out there. 
You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of baseball oh, yeah. books. There's a lot of sports books out there. Oh, yeah. What was kind of in a writing perspective, maybe any inspiration that you had? Because obviously you did a lot of reporting, clearly, uh, based on what you're saying here. But I'm wondering, like, what is kind of a vibe that you were going for, right? What is something that people can expect from uh, your writing in terms of kind of a vibe to it, you know, a mood to it and what have you in telling the story? And if there's any particular favorite baseball books that you have that might have inspired you? Um, there's a couple. There's a couple books that I was kind of going for. Uh, Jane Levy did a book, um, The Last Boy on Mickey Mantle, that I was really moved by and touched by. And I thought that that kind of set the tone for what I think – Ken's story was all about, you know, I think there's a lot of parallels between Ken's story and Mickey Mantle's story. Um, John Branch, he's a New York Times reporter. Um, he wrote a book about a hockey player, uh, Derek Bogard, that um, I thought was really moving as well. And I, I, I read those and I said, this is kind of what I'm going with. This is what I think I'm going after. Um, Andre Agassi's um, memoir was also fantastic. I think it spoke to the... Um, the difficulty of being an elite athlete and the reality of, and it, to, to be an elite anything. I mean, all the effort and determination that, that takes, and sometimes you grow to hate something because it consumes your life. I, I think that was a really important read. I think those were the kind of books I was going after. And it's been, it's been interesting for me to read other books and some of them are great. Some of them miss the mark and you kind of try to figure out why, like, you know, did they mm -hmm. not talk to enough people? Did they not spend enough time on the writing phase? Um, you know, I just I think that a good book is supposed to like stick with you. It really it goes with you places and you think about it afterwards and you think, you know, e e good or bad, like, you know, if it's perfect or not. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of a lot of really good work out there and um, I'm impressed by it. It just it's interesting because as you write a book like this, you feel like it's unique. And then you read other books, you're like, yeah, it kind of hits the same tones in the sense of like, it's the upward rise, it's the success, it's the downward, you know, you, you get that angle of it. But it's interesting being able to throw little wrinkles and changes into it and make it different and stand out. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because, you know, just for my writing process, like I always try and take inspiration from other things too, but I've never, it's just for baseball is so interesting because in baseball and especially the story of Ken, I find that you got to be able to find a bunch of different areas to go on because you also have to talk about him as a player. And I'm also wondering, you know, how are you able to remain also kind of respectful of the fact that this was a tragic ending for a human being. You know what I'm saying? This isn't just a, hey, let's talk about who had the sweetest swing. You know what I yeah. mean? Not just a pure baseball thing. How are you able to kind of balance that? It was really tough. And to be honest, I mean, it took me eight years to end up writing the, the end of this book because I didn't want to write it. It was too mm. emotional. It was too sad. Um, I didn't want to go through that process, no. you know? Um but, but I had to, I mean, I, I talked about it with all the people I talked to because there's always that, there's always that side of it because it's always like, he was great. He was an awesome player. I loved him. He was an awesome guy, but there was that ending. And it's like, oh, uh, it was really tough. It was tough to balance it all. And it was, it was important for me to be able to find light and find fun moments and, and keep that going because we all know it's sad. We all know going yeah. in that this is a sad book. It's not going to be an easy book to digest. And um, and that it's difficult to write that way. I mean, it's emotionally scarring and taxing to write a book like this because of the heaviness and the weight of it. And you know that there's not an easy answer here. Um, as much as I think our sensitivities to some of the issues Ken has faced um, have evolved over time, I think we're more open and understanding about addiction, for example, than we were mm -hmm. when he passed away. Um, yeah. but it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to balance that. And, um, I hope that I have balanced it properly, but I, it's really tough. It's tough to balance a story like Ken's to have the light and the sadness and, um, and, and make sure that you give weight to both, uh, without drifting too far in one way. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I totally get that. Um, on a level of just understanding that you re you really do have to have a balance. I have not had a balance in my writing lately. It's been mostly just a bunch of fun. You guys can go check that out. I did my top 10 baseball movies recently over at justbaseball.com. You guys can check that out. Um, Dan, I'm curious, really quickly, now that I think about do you have a, a selection for the best baseball movie ever? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, hmm. That's a really good question. Uh, Bull Durham's great. Mm -hmm. Major League's great. Yeah. Um, 
I liked Rookie of the Year. I wouldn't put it on the list, maybe near okay. the end, but uh, that was. I remember going to see that. Uh, I went to see that in the movie theater, and then my brother and I rented it, and we watched it like eight times in one weekend. <laughs> um, so that was fun, but I wouldn't say that's a ten best, but it's it's uh, it's somewhere. <laughs> but I would say <laughs> Bull Durham is is fantastic. Yeah, Bull Durham is pretty great. That ranked high on my list. You guys can go check that out. But um, Dan, I am very grateful that. Um, a mutual colleague or a friend, I should guess of ours, Joe Vasil, who yeah. I met through the old Twitter sphere last year. He did a secondary lead podcast yes. over on Ken Kemen and he shout out to Joe. You guys can go listen to that podcast that he did as well. Um, and I was also just going to, you know, touch on, Hey, eight years. It's a long time uh, to, to be sitting on something. Padres fans. This is an example of do not lose the hope. Do not give up on the process. All right. I know they stunk <laughs> last year, but it, as long as a, hey, when you get to the end of the road, I imagine that it's just this feeling of relief and pride and all these sort of mixtures all together. So if he can do the book, then don't worry, guys. Not only can you do anything, but you can still well, keep hope good, which by comparison is a pretty soft <laughs> thing to well, for. I, I look at it like I looked at 97. The 1997 season should have been a great mm. one for the Padres. Nothing turned out right. They sank in the standings. But they are the same elements of the same team that mm -hmm. won the division in 96 and ran away with things in 98 and won the pennant. So, you know, you might be just a couple pieces away. You know, I think, um, you know, you, it's always tough to have those regressions. Um, but there's some really good elements to uh, this this Padres team. And um, I think by June or July, things should be falling into place in terms of people getting healthy and, uh, you know, the talent. So, I, you mm -hmm. know, as long as the Padres can hang tough, you know, with the Dodgers and the Giants, I think they're going to be okay. Absolutely. I feel you, man. And it's been a pretty good start for the Padres for sure this season. Uh, don't know how the Pittsburgh Pirates series, we recorded this a little bit before that. Hopefully they won the series against the Pirates and they didn't, something awful didn't happen and we're just talking so optimistically and whatnot. Trent Grisham. Stop getting out by those inside fastballs, please. You need to do better, my guy. Uh, not really, though. Love, Trent. But, um, uh, Dan, this has been so, so, so much fun for sure. Lastly, want to just say, playing through the pain, Ken Caminetti and the steroids confession that changed baseball forever is out. When is that bad boy coming out? May 31st. May 31st. May is going to be a pretty crazy month. You start with Doctor Strange and you end with the Ken Caminiti biography, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> that is the perfect bookend. It's going to be a great month. And uh, Dan, is there any other thing you'd like to plug? I know you've got a newsletter that is named fantastically with a, is it a Snickers logo? That's what yes. it looks like. Is, it, is that your favorite candy? <laughs> well, I did the Snickers logo because of Ken, because of that, uh, that Mexico series when he got food poisoning and uh -huh. he ate a Snickers bar. He had an IV, he got an IV fluid. He ate a Snickers bar picked himself up off the ground and hit two home runs against the Mets. Um, that was his, that was his highlight. That was his high point. And um, no, he was, if you watch video from that game, he was like wobbling as he was going around the bases. Like he was really mm -hmm. hurting and he still hit two home runs. It was, it was awesome. Incredible. It was Incredible. so badass. It was fantastic. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, uh, Dan good stuff. Uh, that's my, my sub stack and uh, I enjoy writing on there. I put a little couple nuggets from the book on there. I, I plan to do more with that as the book's released and some of these stories are out more. Uh, but I put little fun pieces and stories and essays that I'm thinking about uh, on the Substack, And uh, I'm on Twitter too, dgood73. Absolutely, guys. Be sure to subscribe, follow, check out the book May 31st. I know I will be for sure. Dan, do you have any final maybe even dramatic words that you like to let people know. <laughs> no, I just appreciate the chance to, to talk with you. I appreciate the chance to, to talk about Ken. I think he was a really interesting and fascinating guy and his Padres years were the high point of his career. And um, I think I spent a lot of time diving into those years. So this would be really well reflected in the book in terms of those four seasons he spent in San Diego and, um, no, I'm, I'm appreciative to uh, have the chance to, to talk with you. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And with that said, guys, let me just say, go check out Lockdown MLB, a podcast hosted by Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call him Sully, though. He gets very mad if you don't call him Sully. He talks about the major leagues, both past and present. So he's probably had an episode in Ken Caminiti before. He's been doing this podcast for a long time. 
I don't know, but not to this, not to the detail, of course, as Dan's book, which you guys, of course, got to check out. And with that all being said, guys, of course, that about does it for today's edition of the Lockdown Padres podcast. The only pod that may be better than the Padres themselves. Remember to subscribe to the podcast where your podcast from. <laughs> I, I get every guest with that little pun. Every single person just thinks that's the best. Uh, remember to subscribe to the podcast where your pods from. Follow me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. YouTube, Lockdown Padres, and of course, at LO underscore Padres on Twitter. And until next time, stay safe and of course, stay faithful. My Friar Faithful homies, take care.